Hi, and welcome to the Megalia Rose Studio. You've just seen a few samples of watercolor batik, and the information in this video will cover a step-by-step -step demonstration and instruction on how I complete a watercolor wax resist painting on Jin Washi. Jin Washi is a very thin, light Japanese paper embedded with short fibers. These are techniques that I have developed for myself. But remember, every batik artist develops their own methods over time. If you do decide to try any batik process that uses melted wax and or a hot iron, please use caution. Now let's look at the finished product that we are going to be working on. Here I'm holding the finished painting that's a result of the demonstration that I'll be doing. It is smaller than my usual batik paintings, being only 12 and a half by 19 inches. And I encourage you to begin with a smaller painting, this size or smaller. This will help you understand the process and before you get to the larger paintings. So let's move on to the preliminary process. I first make a preliminary sketch of my main elements, in this instance, two fighting roosters. I make several sketches of each rooster until I'm happy with each depiction and then I separate them by cutting them apart. After cutting them out and positioning them behind the drawing paper, I trace the preliminary sketches onto the paper, positioning each rooster where I want them in the painting. In each drawing, I try to limit finite details and concentrate on drawing areas that will not be too difficult to fill with melted wax. The final drawing will be the same size as the actual painting. In this instance, the size will be 12 and a half inches by 19, which is basically a quarter sheet of gin washi paper. It depends on the painting whether I sketch in the background elements now or later. In this painting, I've decided to wait until the roosters have been painted before deciding on the background composition. My final sketch is ready. But before tracing the sketch onto the gin washi, I want you to better understand the nature of this type of paper. It is a Japanese paper and it is very thin, somewhat like strong tissue paper. When wet with watercolor, it becomes a little more fragile. My best advice is to always treat it gently. As you can see, the gin washi is quite thin. You can trace your drawing onto the gin washi by simply laying the gin washi over the sketch. You can use pencil, permanent markers of various widths to transfer your drawing. You can any use the pens or pencils that you decide to use to trace the actual sketch onto your gin washi paper and what you decide on will depend on the effects you hope to obtain. In this painting I have used mostly a black sharpie ultra fine and a black Micron .005 for smaller detail areas in the head of the roosters. When the drawing is on the gin washi, it's going to be attached to a support board with push pins. But before continuing, let's discuss the support board. For support, I use one or two layers of foam core board covered with coated freezer paper, shiny side up, so that the wax doesn't adhere. I use a very simple package wrap and tape all the edges on the back side. I recommend that you always start with a clean surface. After painting done with the batik method and melted wax and watercolor, the paper as you're going to see in the next slide is gets quite stained and can transfer to the next painting. I attach the painting to the support board with a few push pins, usually one per corner and one per side on the smaller paintings like this one. Now we're ready to wax, but we have a few more considerations to can look at before we do apply wax and watercolor. Firstly, we have to decide what wax or wax mix we want to use and test some colors on Jinwashi so that we can help to decide what colors are going to work best for this. When doing watercolor batik, I use either batik wax, which contains beeswax and paraffin, or just straight paraffin, depending on the degree of cracking 
I hope to obtain at the end of the waxing process. The batik wax is somewhat more flexible, the paraffin more brittle. I sometimes use different waxes for different layers and even mix the batik wax and paraffin in different amounts. This simply develops with experience. This particular painting of roosters is done with batik wax until the very end when I apply what I call the cracking layer of wax, at which time I use paraffin. I melt the wax in food cans with the labels removed in a small electric skillet filled with water. I set the temperature to between 180 and 200 degrees. Never leave the melting wax unattended. Be sure the appliance you use is located in a safe place and that there is always water around the containers of melting wax. There are also commercial wax melters available if you want to go ahead and make that investment. To apply the wax, I use a selection of old watercolor and acrylic brushes of various sizes, large to small. I also sometimes use just a commercial painter's brush in the width I need to apply large areas of wax. One thing that a batik artist always need to remember is that once a wax brush, always a wax brush. So don't use that favorite color watercolor brush by mistake. I have one final consideration I want you to give before starting on your project. I usually take watercolor pencils and get some general ideas of the colors I'm going to use. These of course are not going to be the exact colors, but it enables me to see maybe color patterns that I would prefer. And sometimes by doing these processes in this slow manner, and you're probably saying I want to get to the waxing, but taking time to see problems that might develop before they develop, correcting them so that you may have a more beneficial outcome to the process. After doing that quick color study, I'm now ready to select the actual colors I'm going to use. The watercolors um, I use are usually bright, uh, but I don't make them too intense. I always practice on a small test piece of gin washi. Please use the actual paper you're going to be painting on when testing colors because they can change with the different papers. Once I've decided on the actual colors, I put them on my palette and we are going to begin to actually wax and paint. Always be sure that the watercolor you've applied is dry before you apply the wax over it. That is an important step. Here are several steps I've done together. The first is that white ruff of white feathers around the neck of the rooster. I have shaded those lightly with indigo. And also the eye was done, it's, you cannot see it too well here, but the eye was done with quinacritin burnt orange. When both of those were dry, I applied wax so that they are protected. I then decided to not make the painting too stilted, too regimented, and I went ahead and applied new gamboge to the leg, foot, the beak, and the area to the right of the wattle, and let those kind of run to add some interest. I then went to the back and side, but I left that one left-hand rooster wing undone, but you'll see the paint does run into that. When all of these are dry, I continue and put on wax on everything that I have painted. If you like to get a layering effect, only apply wax to certain things, like the feathers or behind the feathers so that they'll stand out. You'll see how that was done in the final painting. So this time you're just going to have to relax and think. It is a process. Enjoy. As you noticed from the dullness on the rooster on the lower right hand corner, uh, much of the body has had wax put on it as well as the white feathers on the neck, the beak, the wattle, the comb and the feet. Uh, before I did wax the feet, I did shadow them a little bit with quinacridin burnt orange. Now I've painted the rooster in the upper left much like the lower rooster. Same colors, uh, new gamboge, quinacridin burnt orange, quinacridin gold, and a little bit of shading on that lower right hand a leg of a little bit of, um, actually I used cobalt blue when mixed with quinacridin burnt orange makes sort of a grayish color. If you find the wax is dragging, it is simply not hot enough. So make sure you kick it up a few degrees, let the brush soak in the warmer wax and give it a try again and the wax should flow very smoothly. 
Now in this step, the bottom right rooster's body has been entirely covered in wax. This of course will be sometimes a couple of layers depending on if you try to do some layering, uh, getting lighter colors covered and then waxing after you've put in some dark colors. The upper left hand rooster's wing on his right side there is not waxed yet, it is drying but the rest of his body you can see is dull and has been waxed. I've begun on the tail feathers on both birds using a combination of New Gamboge and uh, Quinacritin Burnt Orange and I will be waiting till those are dried, cover them with wax before I go on to other tail feathers. All the tail feathers have now been painted. There was a little change of plans when I saw how interestingly some of the colors, especially the greens, blended into some of the unpainted tail feathers, so I decided to leave them white. Originally I was going to paint them, but uh, I enjoyed that effect. They've all been waxed, excepting on the upper bird. The dark blues have not been waxed, but the paint is drying. As soon as this is dry, I will go ahead and wax those over and begin thinking about my background. One thing I want you to notice and to think about is the fact that as you're moving wax over to different areas of the painting, there will be drips and smears. That is part of batik. Let them be. Right now, the ones that are on the white areas are invisible, but when I put a wash on those, we may see some interesting developments. Now that the roosters are completely painted and wax covered with wax so that there's no other colors that are going to bleed into their areas, I'm going to turn to the background and I've decided on a very light foreground that I'm going to hope to texture a little bit with layers to look like straw. A wooden structure on the right and top that could be a barn door or a large coops door. And then through that midsection eventually the last thing I will paint is a view of the sky in blues and greens in the bottom to indicate shrubbery. So I first apply a very light layer of new gamboge to the foreground. And uh, when dry, I apply thin streaks of wax in a random pattern that I'm hoping is going to look like texture and hint at straw. The wooden board areas are first painted with a light, raw umber. And when dry, I'm going to apply wax in long, thin streaks that eventually, I hope, are going to also create texture and the illusion of wood grain. But that's going to involve some layering, which I will show you in the next step. But first I'm going to show a close-up of that barn detail in the upper right hand corner. Here you can see a detail of that upper right hand corner of the painting in which the uh, boards are meeting. The initial coat again was of a raw umber and then the corner I've dabbed in while the raw umber was wet a little bit of burnt umber just to add some texture down the line. Now part of my thinking process is that you'll notice that the raw umber has bled into what is going to be the sky area. This is some of the planning that has to go on when you're doing batik. For example, if I had done the sky before I waxed those boards, the blue, in this case it will be Prussian blue, will bleed into the boards. And it will be impossible to cover that up or to blend it in any way to make sense for me. So in this case, the bleeding of the raw umber is coming into the sky area, which when the blue is applied, will either turn to a shade of blue or possibly mix with a little bit of green. So again, when you're dealing with gin washi and the fact that the paint is going to bleed and mix all over the place, have a plan so that you know that the colors that you're applying will mix properly and give you the effect that you're hoping for. Now this is a slide of the foreground, which I first applied a thin, very light wash of a uh, pardon me, quinacridin gold in the corners and a new gamboge for most of it, very light. I let that dry, then applied melted wax in a slashing random pattern, which you can see there were also some drips in there. When the wax was set, I did cover the entire area with a little bit of deep sap and more quinacritin gold and you can see that it pulled forward the colors of the straw that I'm trying to uh, emulate here. Uh, this is part of layering. This can go on for many layers. This is a very simple one and I just wanted to show that to you for example. Now this is a close-up slide of the wood areas. Remember I had first painted a very light raw umber and then in the corners a little bit of burnt umber. Let those dry then applied streaks, long narrow streaks of wax to preserve those lighter colors. 
Once the wax was set, I applied a mixture of full uh, burnt umber, a little bit of burnt sienna, and just brushed that into those areas. Now I'm going to be waxing, once the paint is dry, I'm going to wax those entire areas as well as those straw foreground areas. Cover those areas completely in wax, which leaves only that center sky, perhaps shrubbery area for me to do next. The only areas of the painting not covered with wax completely now is that mid area of sky and shrubbery. I chose Prussian blue, began in the upper left hand corner and pulled it down at a diagonal toward the lower rooster. I put in a bit of yellow in the upper right hand corner and then on the bottom left is a mixture of deep sap, quinacritin gold and places where the Prussian blue have simply bled into that. And here you can see how drips of wax suddenly appear of which I was unaware at the time they fell because of the white paper and the very clear wax. So the painting's basically done and I apply wax over the entire mid sky shrub area. So now all the entire painting has at least one coat of wax on it. I'm now going to move forward to what I call the cracking layer. What I call the cracking layer is a layer of melted wax that is imply, applied over the entire painting, all the other areas that have been waxed and painted. The choice of wax you use for this varies. Uh, in this particular case, I'm going to use straight paraffin wax because when it's cold, it tends to crack more definitely. So at this point, I have put that layer over this entire piece. And now to keep it comfortably cold so it cracks better, in the summer, I put it in the refrigerator if it's large, <laughs> not too large to do. And in the winter, I simply set it outside. While this is happening, I begin setting up my ironing area. As I mentioned before, the cracking layer is usually does a better job when it's cool. So you can see here that I was able to set this one outside. Being winter in Northern California, we had a little snow. So I'm assured of a nice cold cracking layer to come and make things very interesting. While that painting is cooling, I begin setting up my ironing area. The iron needs to be a dry heated iron set to the highest setting, which is usually cotton or linen. Please be sure no steam. Use a dry iron or a steam iron set to dry and water removed from the reservoir. My kitchen is the easiest place to start this process. I first cover the area I'm going to be using the iron on with a large heavy duty towel. It's an old throwaway towel so I'm not too worried about that. Over the towel I paste a large heavy duty garbage bag or a tarp and then over that I place a large piece of cardboard at least several inches larger on each dimension than the actual painting is going to be. Bring the still cold painting into your studio and remove the push pins and begin lifting the painting from the support board. Gently slide your hand under the painting if it seems to stick to the board a bit. The lifting process will usually cause the wax to crack but usually more cracking is desired push and press randomly around different areas of the painting. There is no way to guarantee the outcome of this cracking process. Be patient and accepting of the process and the unpredictability of the result. I have often been surprised that what I at first thought was a terrible outcome turned out to be an extremely successful painting. When you feel you have completed the cracking process, lay the painting back on the support board without pinning and make a dark watercolor wash on your palette. In the demonstration painting, I used a wash made from mixing dark sap green and indigo. The wash colors and intensity can vary with each painting and only experience will tell you if you're going to get what you want. With a large brush, I apply the dark wash over the painting, sometimes working it into various cracks. If you can hold the painting up high enough to see the back, you can sometimes see where dark lines and areas are developing. Personally, I like to be surprised. Now you're going to take hot wax in the next step and cover the entire painting. This forces some of the wash into the cracks. 
When the entire painting is covered, it's time to turn on, off the heated wax and turn on the iron. Here's another slide of the, what, the dark wash that I am working into the cracks of the painting. Uh, you cover everything. Just go all over with that. And even though it's resisted by the wax, you can see the little droplets. When we put the next layer of wax over that, it will help push that wash into the cracks. This slide shows the final waxing over the wash. I use batik wax in this layer, being a little more um, malleable. It will sometimes help push more of the wash into the cracks. Uh, at this point, I'm going to let that set, turn on the iron, turn off the wax, and get ready to remove all those layers of wax and see what kind of painting I have made. Lay the painting over the cardboard that's been covered with several layers of newsprint, the topmost layer being clean, clear newsprint or craft paper. You can see on the right that you're going to lay over a clean piece of newsprint or craft paper and then several layers of regular newsprint. You will iron over this paper, never iron directly onto the wax. And again, this will be the heavy side of the wax up you're going to try to be melting that. And in a moment I'll show you what that's going to start looking like on the paper. Here you can see as the heated iron is run over that paper, that newsprint, that the wax melts and is absorbed by the various layers of paper. Be sure that you continually use clean paper on the top there and toward the end we are going to flip the painting over and wax, remove wax from the back. Here you can see that not much but not all of the wax has been removed from the bottom half of the painting. You will simply continue this process until the entire front is pretty much has most of the wax removed if not all. You will know that by when you run the iron over that piece of paper, that newsprint, that very little if no wax appears. At that point you're going to turn the painting over. Do the same process on the back to ensure that all the wax possible has been removed. Take your time. This is a very important step and I think that you will enjoy what you're seeing developing as the iron removes that wax. Here is the back of the painting as I prepare to put on more newsprint paper and remove the last vestiges of wax. At this point, once all the wax is removed, don't be concerned if the painting seems dark and, and very dull you're going to lay it on a white surface and you will see how the completed painting will actually look. Jinwashi is very fragile and transparent somewhat and fragile so what we do is mount it on a piece of white matte board. Here I'm holding the painting that's been mounted on a piece of white archival matte board. It's sometimes surprising how dull the painting can look until there is that white backing on it. And now let's discuss the way I usually mount this fragile jinwashi onto a support board. The first step for me is to cut a piece of map board that is the approximate size of the painting. There are as many ways to mount the finished painting onto the mat board as there are batik artists. You can use spray adhesives, other types of glues and paste. But my preferred method is to use Yes Paste, which is um, archivally safe for the materials. I apply it to half of the mat board with a stiff hog bristle brush. I set the painting on the pasted area and I smooth it down with a brayer. Then I lift the unattached half of the painting, apply the paste, and lay the painting down and smooth again, repeating with the brayer. At this point, I let the painting lay flat as it dries. I give it at least overnight to make sure that everything is totally dry. And then we can think about how we're going to make corrections. I'm sometimes asked if you can correct what you see as errors on a batik painting. And my answer is yes and no. If you need to attempt a correction, thick watercolor or gouache can sometimes work. Remember that now that wax has impregnated the jinwashi paper, it will want to repel water. If there is a minor tear in the jinwashi, it can often be repaired as the painting is attached to the mat board. And finally, if a detail is lost, sometimes permanent markers 
can be used. Be willing to experiment and also be willing to sometimes accept how the batik turns out. Once I've made any corrections that I want, I matte and frame my watercolor batiks much like any other watercolor painting. But how you decide to present your creation is strictly up to you. Thank you for joining me on this creative journey. And I hope that you take some of the information and create your own style and your own methods. Batik is an emerging watercolor media and I think we can all contribute. I welcome your questions. You can email me by going to the contact page on my website, MiguelYaRose.com. Until the next video, I hope you have a good time trying batik.